Traditions and Encounters of Brief Global History by McGraw-Hill, Chapter 1, Part 2. Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers. The place name Mesopotamia comes from two Greek words meaning the land between rivers. This was one of four river va re valley regions in which civilizations were established. Each shared important geographical features including dry soils, an environment that was slowly drying <clears throat> and warming following the end of the last ice age, and seasonally flooding rivers that made irrigation agriculture pos possible. So although Mesopotamia received little rainfall, the Tigris and Euphrates brought large volumes of fresh water to the region. Each cultivator's realized that by tapping these rivers, building reservoirs, and digging canals, they could irrigate fields of barley, wheat, and peas. Small-scale irrigation began in Mesopotamia soon after 6000 BCE. Sumer, artificial irrigation led to increased food supplies, which in turn supported a rapidly increasing human population and attracted migrants from other regions. Human, member, human numbers grew especially fast in the land of Sumer in the southern half of Mesopotamia. By about 5000 BCE, the Sumerians were constructing elaborate irrigation networks that helped them realize the abundant agricultural harvest. By 3000 BCE, the population of Sumer approached 100,000, an unprecedented concentration of people in ancient times. And the Sumerians dominate Mesopota people of Mesopotamia. Semitic migrants, while supporting a growing population, the wealth of Sumer also attracted migrants from other regions. Most of the new arrivals were Semitic peoples, so-called because they spoke tongues in the Semitic family of languages, including Akkadian, Aramaic, Hebrew, and Phoenician. Semitic peoples were nomadic herders who went to Mesopotamia from the Arabian and Syrian deserts to the south and west. <coughs> Excuse me. They often intermarried with the Sumerians and they largely adapted in Sumerian ways. Sumerian cities, city-states. Beginning about 4,000 BCE, the human numbers increased in southern Mesopotamia. The Sumerians built the world's first cities. These cities also, these cities differed mar markedly from the Neolithic villages that preceded them. Unlike the earlier settlements, the Sumerian cities were centers of political and military authority, and their jurisdiction extended into the surrounding regions. Moreover, bustling marketplaces that drew buyers and sellers from near and far turned, into, turned the cities into economic centers as well. Finally, the cities also served as cultural centers where priests maintained organized religions and scribes developed traditions of writing and formal education for almost a millennium from 3200 to 2350 BCE. A dozen Sumerian cities, Urdu, Ur, Uruk, Lagash, Nippur, Kish, and others dominated public affairs in Mesopotamia. These cities all experienced internal and external pressures that prompted them to establish states. Formal governmental institutions that wielded authority throughout their territories. Internally, the cities needed recognized authorities to maintain order and ensure that inhabitants incorporated on community projects. With their expanding populations, the cities also needed to prevent conflicts between urban residents from escalating into serious civic disorder. In addition, because agriculture was crucial to the welfare of urban residents, the cities all became city-states. 
They not only controlled public life within the city walls, but also oversaw affairs in surrounding agricultural regions. While preserving the peace, recognized authorities, we also needed to organize work on projects of value to the entire community. Palaces, temples, and defenses, defensive walls dominated all Sumerian cities. Particularly impressive were the ziggurats, distinctive stepped pyramids that housed temples and altars to the principal local deity. The more, more important, however, were the irrigation systems that supported productive agriculture and urban society. As their population grew, the Sumerians expanded their networks of reservoirs and canals, whose construction and maintenance required untold thousands of laborers and provided precious water for Sumerian crops. Sumerian Kings as the wealth of the Sumerian cities grew, they began to face increasing external problems from raiders outside the cities. The cities responded to that threat of, by building defensive walls and organizing military forces. Thus, the need to recruit, train, equip, maintain, and deploy military forces created another demand for recognized authority to answer that demand. The earliest Sumerian government, governments were probably made up of assemblies of prominent men who made decisions on behalf of the whole community. By about 3000 BCE, however, most Sumerian cities were ruled by individual kings known as Lugals, who claimed absolute authority within their realms by 2500 BCE. City rules... City-states ruled by kings dominated public life in Sumer. The course of empire, <coughs> excuse me, conflicts between city-states often led to war between ambitious or aggravated kings. However, after 2350 BCE, a series of conquerors sought to put an end to constant conflicts by building empires that supervised the affairs of numerous subjects subject cities and peoples sargon of akkad the first of these conquerors w was sargon of akkad a talented administrator and brilliant warrior sargon 2370 to 2315 bce began his career as a minister to the king of kish about 2334 bce he organized a coup against the king recruited an army, and went on the offensive against the Sumerian city-states. He conquered the cities one by one, destroyed their defensive walls, and placed them under his own governors and administrators. Sargon financed his empire by seizing control of trade routes and taxing the goods that traveled along them, which allowed him to transform his capital, Atticod, into the wealthiest and most powerful city in the world. At the high point of his reign, his empire embraced all of Mesopotamian and his armies had ventured as far afield as the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. By about 2150 BCE, Sargon's empire had collapsed in the midst of the rebellion from within the evade and invasion from outsiders. Yet the memory of his deeds Records recorded in legend and histories, as well as in his own works of propaganda, inspired later conquerors to follow his example. Most prominent of these later latter conquerors was the Babylonian Hammurabi, reigned in 1792 to 1750 BCE. E. He styled himself king of the four quarters of the world. Hammurabi improved on Sargon's administrative techniques by relying on centralized bureaucratic rule and regular taxation rather than this on suppression and plunder. Law on Hammurabi's Babylon. By these means, Hammurabi developed a more efficient and predictable 
government than his predecessors and also spread its costs more evenly over the population. Hammurabi also sought to maintain his empire by providing it with a code of law, which became the most extensive and complete Mesopotamian law code up to the point up to that point in the prologue to his laws Hammurabi proclaimed that the gods had chosen him to promote the welfare of the people to cause justice to prevail in the land to destroy the wicked and evil that the strong might not oppress the weak to rise like the sun over people and to light up in the land harper 1904 Hammurabi's law established high standards of behavior and stern punishments for st for violators. They prescribed death penalties for murder, theft, fraud, false accusations, sheltering of runaway slaves, failure to obey royal orders, adultery, and incest. Civil laws regulated prices, wages, commercial dealings, marital relations, and conditions of slavery. The code relied heavily on the principle that offenders should suffer punishments resembling their violations. However, the code did not treat all social classes equally and demanded lesser punishments for those of higher classes who committed crimes against those of lower classes. In addition, local judges did not always follow the prescriptions of Hammurabi's code. Indeed, they frequently relied on their own judgment when deciding cases that came before them. Nevertheless, Hammurabi's laws established a set of common standards that lent some degree of cultural unity to the far-flung Babylonian Empire. Eventually, the wealth of the Babylonian Empire attracted invaders. Foremost among them were the Hittites, who had built a powerful empire in, in, in Anatolia, modern-day Turkey. By about 1595 BCE, the Babylonian Empire had crumbled before Hittite assaults for several centuries after the fall of Babylon. Southwest Asia was a land of considerable turmoil as regional states competed for power and position while Migrants and invaders struggled to establish footholds for themselves in Mesopotamia and neighboring regions. The Assyrian Empire. Imperial rule returned to Mesopotamia with the Assyrians, a people from northern Mesopotamia who had built a compact state in the Tigris River valley during the 19th century BCE. Taking advantage of their location on trade routes running both north and south and east and west, the Assyrians built flourishing cities at Assyr and Nineveh. They built a powerful and intimidating army by organizing their forces into standardized units and placing them under the command of professional officers chosen on the basis of merit and skill. They supplemented infantry and with cavalry forces and light, swift, horse-drawn chariots, which they borrowed from the which they borrowed from the Hittites. These chariots were devastating instruments of war that allowed archers to attack their enemies from rapidly moving platforms. <coughs> Excuse me. Many states jockeyed for power following the collapse of the Babylonian Empire, but after about 1300 BCE, the Assyrians gradually extended their authority to much of the Southwest Asia. At its high point during the 8th and 7th century BCE, the Assyrian Empire embraced not only the Mes Mesopotamia, but also Syria, Palestine, much of Anatolia, and most of U Egypt. Like most of the Mesopotamian peoples, the Assyrians relied on the administrative techniques pioneered by the, their Babylonian predecessors, and they followed laws much like those enshrined in the Code of Hammurabi. They also preserved a great deal of Mesopotamian literature in huge libraries maintained at their large 
and lavish courts. Yet Assyrian domination was extremely unpopular and proved impossible to maintain in 612 BCE. A combination of internal unrest and external assault brought, by, brought the empire down. The New Babylonian Empire for half a century, from 600 to 550 BCE, Babylon once again dominated Mesopotamia during the New Babylonian Empire, sometimes called the Chaldean Empire. King Nebuchadnezzar reigned from 605 to 562 BCE, excuse me, lavished wealth and resources on his capital city. Babylon occupied some 850 hectares more than 2,100 acres, and the city's def defensive walls were reportedly so thick that a four-horse chariot could turn around on top of them. Within the walls, <clears throat> they were there were enormous palaces and 1,179 temples, some of them faced with gold and decorated with thousands of statues. When one of the king's wives longed for flowering shrubs on her mountain homeland, Nebuchadnezzar had them planted in terraces above the city walls, and the hanging gardens of Babylon have symbolized the city's luxuri luxuriousness ever since. By this time, however, people beyond Mesopotamia had acquired advanced weapon and were experimenting with techniques of administering large territories. As a result, in the mid-6th century BCE, Mesopotamians largely lost control of their affairs and foreign conquerors absorbed them into their own empires. The formation of complex society and sophisticated cultural traditions. With the emergence of cities and the congregation of dense population in urban spaces, Specialized labor proliferated, the Mesopotamian economy became increasingly diverse, and trade linked the region with distant peoples. Clearly defined social classes emerged as small groups of people concentrated wealth and power in their own hands. <coughs> Excuse me. And Mesopotamia developed into a patriarchal society that vested authority largely in adult males. Mesopotamia also allocated some of their resources to individuals who worked to develop sophisticated cultural traditions, including the invention, invention of writing, which excuse me, enabled them to record information for future re retrieval. Indeed, writing soon became a foundation for education, science, literature, and religious reflection, economic specialization, and trade. When large number of people began to congregate in cities and work at tasks other than agriculture, they vastly expanded the stock of human skills, craftsmen refined techniques inherited from earlier generations and experimented with new ways of of doing things pottery making textile manufacture woodworking leather production brick making stone cutting and masonry all became distinct occupations of in the world's earliest cities bronze metallur metallurgy metallurgical inventions ranked among the most important developments that came about because of specialized labor. About 3,500 BCE, experimentation with copper metallurgy led to the invention of, the, of bronze when Mesopotamian workers learned to alloy copper with tin. Unlike pure copper, bronze is both hard and strong, and it has quickly become became the preferred metal for me military weaponry as craftsmen turned out swords, spears, axes, shields, and armor made of the recently invented metal. And although bronze was expensive, over a long period of Mesopotamian farmers 
also began to use bronze knives and bronze tipped plows instead of tools made of bone, wood, stone, or obsidian. Iron metallurgy. After about 1000 BCE, Mesopotamian craftsmen began to manufacture both effective tools and weapons with iron as well as bronze, whereas earlier ex early experimentation with iron metallurgy results resulted in products that were too brittle for heavy duty uses. By about 1300 BCE, craftsmen from the Hittite society in Anatolia, discussed later in this chapter, developed techniques of forging exceptionally strong iron tools and weapons. As knowledge of these of those techniques spread, Assyrian conquerors made particularly effective use of them by foraging forging iron weapons to build their empire. Iron also had the advantage of being less expensive than bronze, which quickly made it the metal of choice for weapons and tools. The wheel. Other craftsmen focused on devising efficient means of transportation based on wheeled vehicles and sailing ships, both of which facilitated long-distance trade. Sumerians first invented the wheel in about 3500 BCE, e, and they were building wheeled carts by 3000 BCE. Wheeled carts and wagons enabled people to haul heavy loads of bulk goods over much longer distances than human porters or draft animals could manage. The wheel rapidly diffused from Sumer to neighboring lands, and within few centuries, it had become a standard of means of overland transportation. <clears throat> Shipbuilding. Sumerians also experimented with technologies of maritime transportation by about 3,500 BCE. They had built watercraft that allowed them to venture into the Persian Gulf and beyond. By 2300 BCE, they were trading regularly with merchants and harpen societies in the Indus River Valley of, the, of northern India discussed in chapter 3, which they reached by sailing through the Persian Gulf and the Arabian Sea until about 1750 BCE. Sumerian merchants shipped wooden textiles, leather goods, sesame oil, and jewelry to India in ex exchange for copper, ivory, pearls, and semi-precious stones. During the time of the Babylonian Empire, Mesopotamians traded extensively with peoples in all directions. They imported silver from Anatolia, cedarwood from Lebanon, copper from Arabia, gold from Egypt, tin from Persia, lapis lazuli from Afghanistan, and carnelian from Gujarat. Trade Networks Archaeological excavations have shed bright light on one Mesopotamian trade network in particularly particular during the early second millennium BCE Assyrian merchants traveled regularly by donkey caravan some 1600 kilometers which is about a thousand miles from their home to Assur in northern Mesopotamia to Kanish modern Kultipi in Anatolia Surviving correspondence shows that during the 45 years from 1810 to 1765 BCE, merchant transported, merchants transported at least 80 tons of tin and 100,000 textiles from Assur and returned from Kanish with no less than 10 tons of silver. The correspondence also shows that the merchants and their families <clears throat> operated a well-organized business. Merchants, wives, and children manufactured test textiles in Assur and sent them home, sent them to their menfolk who lived in trading colonies at Kanish. The merchants responded with orders for textiles in that styles desired at Kanish. The emergence of stratified and of a paint of a stratified 
patriarchal society. With their increasingly specialized labor and long distance trade, cities provided many more opportunities for the first ac accumulation of wealth than ever before. As a result, social distinctions of Mesopotamia became much more sharply defined than those of Neolithic villages. Social classes. In early Mesopotamia, the ruling classes originally consisted of kings and nobles who were elected to their position because of their valor and success as warriors. However, royal status soon became hereditary. As kings arranged for their sons to succeed them, nobles were mostly members of royal families and other close supporters of the kings and thus controlled significant wealth and power. Members of the ruling class displayed their high status through large-scale construction projects and by lavishly decorating their, the, their capital cities. Temple communities, closely allied with the ruling elites, were priests and priestesses, many of whom were younger relatives of the rulers. The principal role of the priest, priestly elites was to intervene with the gods and in to ensure good fortune for their communities. In exchange for those services, priestesses, priests and priestesses lived in temple communities and received offerings of food, drink, and clothing from city inhabitants. Temples also generated income from the vast tracts of land that they owned and large workshops that they maintained because of their wealth. Temples provided comfortable livings, for their inhabitants, and they also serve the needs of lar the larger community. For instance, temples functioned as banks where individuals could store wealth, and they helped underwrite trading ventures to distant lands. They also helped those in need by taking in orphans, supplying grain in times of famine, and providing ransoms for community members captured in battle. Apart from the ruling and priestly elites, Mesopotamian society included less privileged classes of free commoners, dependent clients, and slaves. Free commoners mostly worked as peasant cultivators on in the countryside on land owned by their families, although some also worked in the cities as builders, craftsmen, or professionals. Dependent clients possessed no property and usually worked as agricultural laborers on estates owned by others. Free commoners and dependent clients all paid taxes, usually in the form of surplus agricultural production that supported the ruling classes, military forces, and temple communities. In addition, free commoners and dependent clients were subject to conscription by ruling authorities to provide labor services for large-scale construction projects such as roads, city walls, irrigation systems, temples, and public buildings. Slaves. Slaves came from three main sources, prisoners of war, convicted criminals, and heavily indebted individuals who sold themselves into slavery to satisfy their obligations. Some slaves worked as agricultural laborers on the state of nobles or temples, temple communities, but most were domestic servants in wealthy households. Many masters granted slaves their freedom, often with a financial bequest after several years of good service. In addition, recognizing differences of rank, wealth, and social status, Mesopotamians built a patriarchal society that vast, vested authority over public and private affairs in adult men. Men made the, of the important decisions within households and dominated public life as well. In effect, men ruled as kings and decisions about policies and public affairs rested almost entirely in their hands. Gender roles. Hammurabi's laws throw considerable light on sex and gender relations in ancient Mesopotamia. The laws recognized men as heads of their households and entrusted all major family decisions to their, to their judgment. Men even had the power to sell their wives and children into slavery to satisfy their debts. In the interest of protecting the reputations of husbands and legitimacy of offspring, 
The laws prescribed death by drowning as the punishment for adulterous wives as well as their, for their partners, while permitting men to engage in consensual sexual relations with concubines, slaves, or prostitutes without penalty. In spite of their sub subordinate legal status, women made their influence felt in Mesopotamian society. At ruling courts, women sometimes advised kings and their governments. A few women wielded a great power as high priestesses who managed the enormous estates belonging to their temples. Others obtained a formal education and worked as scribes. Literate individuals who prepared administrative and legal documents for governments and private parties. Women also per pursued careers as midwives, shopkeepers, brewers, bakers, tavern keepers, and textile manufacturers. During the second millennium BCE, however, Mesopotamian men progressively tightened their control over the social and sexual behavior of women. To protect family fortunes and guarantee the legitimacy of heirs, Mesopotamians insisted on the virginity of brides at marriage, and they forbade in casual socializing between married women and men outside of their family. By about 1500 BCE, and probably even earlier, married women in Mesopotamian cities had begun to wear veils when they, were, when they ventured beyond their own households in order to discourage the attention of men from other families. This concern to control women's social and sexual behavior spread throughout much of, of Southwest Asia and the Mediterranean basin where it reinforced patriarchal social, social structures. The development of written cultural traditions. The world's earliest writing came from Mesopotamian, Mesopotamia. Sumerians invented a system of writing about the middle of the fourth millennia BCE to keep track of the commercial transaction and tax collection. They first experimented with pictographs represented, representing animals, agriculture, products, and trade items that figured prominently in tax and commercial transactions. By 3100 BCE, conventional sign, signs represented specific words had spread throughout Mesopotamia. A writing system that depends on pictures is useful for purposes such as keeping records, but it is a cumbersome way to communicate abstract ideas. Beginning about 2900 BCE, the Sumerian developed a more flexible system of writing that used graphic symbols to represent sounds, syllables, and ideas, as well as physical objects. By combining pictographs and other symbols, the Sumerians created a powerful writing system. Cuneiform writing. When writing, a Sumerian scribe used a stylus fashion fashioned from reed to impress symbols on wet clay because the stylus left lines and wedge-shaped marks. A Sumerian writing is known as cuneiform, a term that comes from two Latin words meaning wedge-shaped. When dried in the sun or baked in an oven, the clay... Ooh, sorry. Wedge shaped when dried in the sun, baked in the oven, the clay hardened and preserved a permanent record of the scribe's message. Babylonians, Assyrians, and other peoples later adapted the Sumerian scribe to their own languages, and the tradition of cuneiform writing continued for more than 3,000 years. Though originally invented for purposes of keeping records, writing clearly had potential that went far beyond the purely practical matter of storing information. Mesopotamians relied on writing to communicate complex ideas about the world, the gods, human beings, and their relationships with one another. Indeed, writing made possible the emergence of distinctive cultural tradition that shaped Mesopotamian values for almost three millennia astronomy and mathematics, literacy led to a rapid expansion of knowledge. Mesopotamian scholars devoted themselves to the study of astronomy and mathematics, both important sciences for agricultural societies, 
Knowledge of astronomy helped them prepare accurate calendars, which in turn enabled them to chart the rhythms of the seasons and determine the appropriate times for planting and harvesting crops. They used their mathematical skills to survey agricultural lands and allocate them to the proper owners or tenants. Some Mesopotamian conventions persist to the present day. Mesopotamian scientists divided the year into 12 months. For example, they divided the hour into 60 minutes, each composed of 60 seconds. The Epic of Gilgamesh. <coughs> <clears throat> Mesopotamians also used writing to communicate abstract ideas, investigate intellectual and religious problems, and reflect on human beings and their place in the world. Best known as the reflective literature from Mesopotamia the, is the Epic of Gilgamesh, completed, around, completed after 2000 BCE, in recounting the experiences of Gilgamesh and Enkidu, the epic explored themes of friendship relations between humans and the gods, and especially the meaning of life and the inevi inevitably of death. The stories of Gilgamesh and Enkidu resonated so widely that for some 2,000 years, from the time of the Sumerian city city-states to the fall of the Assyrian Empire, they were the principal vehicles for Mesopotamian reflections on moral issues. The broader influence of Mesopotamian society. While building cities and regional states, Mesopotamians deeply influenced the development and experiences of peoples living far beyond their own lands. Often their wealth and power attracted the attention of neighboring peoples. Some Mesopotamians projected their power to leave foreign lands and imposed their ways by force. Occasionally migrants left Mesopotamia to, and carried their inherited traditions to new lands. Mesopotamia influence did not completely transform other peoples and turn <clears throat> them into carbon copies of Mesopotamians. On the contrary, other peoples adopted Mesopotamian ways selectively and adapted them to their own needs and interests. Yet the broader impact of the Mesopotamian society shows that even in early times, complex agricultural societies organized around cities had strong potential influence the development of distant human communities. Hebrews, Israelites, Israelites, and Jews. <clears throat> the best known... Case, cases of early Mesopotamian influence involved Hebrews, Israelites, and Jews who preserved memories of their historical experiences in an extensive collection of sacred writings. Hebrews were speakers of the ancient Hebrew language. Israelites formed a branch of Hebrews who settled in Palestine. Modern-day Israel after 1300 BCE Jews descended from southern Israelites who inhabited the kingdom of Judea for more than 2,000 years. Hebrews, Israelites, and Jews interacted consistently, constantly with the Mesopotamians and other peoples, as well with the profound consequences for the development of their own societies. Early Hebrews, the earliest Hebrews were pastoral nomads who inhabited lands between Mesopotamia and Egypt during the second millennia BCE. As Mesopotamia prospered, some of the Hebrews settled in the region's cities. According to the Hebrew scripture, Old Testament of the Christian Bible, the Hebrew patriarch Abraham came from the Sumerian city of Ur, but he migrated to northern Mesopotamia about 1850 BCE. Abraham's descendants continued to recognize many of the deities, values, and customs com common to Mesopotamian peoples. Hebrew law, for example, borrowed heavily from Hammurabi's, Hammurabi's law code. The Hebrews also told the story of a devastating flood that had destroyed all early human society, which was a variation of similar flood stories related from the earliest days 
of Sumerian society. One of one early version of the story made its way into the Epic of Gilgamesh. The Hebrews altered the story and adapted it to their own interest and purposes, but their familiarity of the with the flood story shows that they participated fully in the larger society of Mesopotamia. Migrants and settlements in Palestine. According to their scriptures, some Hebrews migrated from Palestine to Egypt during the 18th century BCE. About 1300 BCE, however, this branch of Hebrews departed under the leadership of Moses and returned to Palestine, organized into a loose federation of 12 tribes. Those Hebrews, known as the Israelites, fought bitterly with other inhabitants of Palestine <clears throat> and carved out a territory for themselves. Eventually, the Israelites abandoned their inherited tribal structure in favor of Mesopotamian style monarchy that brought all their 12 tribes under unified rule during the reigns of King David, 1970 BCE, and King Solomon, 970 to 930 BCE. Israelites dominated the territory between Syria and the Sinai, Sinai Peninsula. They built an elaborate and cosmopolitan city, capital city at Jerusalem, and entered into diplomatic and commercial relations with Mesopotamians, Egyptians, and Arabian peoples. Like other peoples of Southwest Asia, the Israelites made use of iron technology to strengthen their military forces and produce tough agricultural implements. Moses and Monotheism after the time of Moses, however, the religious beliefs of the Israelites developed along increasingly distinctive lines. Whereas the early Hebrews had recognized many of the same gods as their Mesopotamian neighbors, Moses embraced monotheism. He taught that there was only one God named, known as Yahweh, who was a supremely powerful deity, the creator and sustainer of the world. Yahweh expected his followers to worship him alone, and he demanded that they observe high moral and ethical standards in the Ten Commandments, a set of religious and ethical principles that Moses announced to the Israelites. Yahweh warned his followers against destructive and antisocial behavior such as lying, theft, adultery, and murder. Between 1000 and 400 BCE, the Israelites' religious Leaders compiled their teachings in a set of holy scriptures known as the Torah, Hebrew for doctrine or teaching, which laid down Yahweh's laws and outlined his role in creating the world and guiding human affairs. The Torah taught that Yahweh would reward those who obeyed his will and punish those who did not. Assyrian and Babylonian conquests. The Israelites placed increasing emphasis on devotion to Yahweh as they experienced a series of political and military setbacks. Following King Solomon's reign, tribal tensions led to the dis division of the community into a large kingdom of Israel in the north and a smaller kingdom of Judah in the land known as Judea to the south in 722 BCE, Assyrian forces conquered to the northern kingdom and deported many of its inhabitants to other regions, causing many of the deported to lose their identity as Israelites. In 586 BCE, the new Babylon, Babylonian Empire toppled the kingdom of Judah and destroyed Jerusalem, forcing many residents into exile. Unlike their cousins to the north, however, most of these Israelites maintained their religious identity, and many of these deportees eventually returned to Judea, where they became known as Jews. Ironically, perhaps, the Israelites' devotion to Yahweh intensified during this era, era of turmoil. Between the 9th and 6th centuries BCE, a series of prophets urged the Israelites to re 
rededicate themselves to their faith and obey Yahweh's commandments. Failure to do so, they warned, would be punished by Yahweh in the form of conquest by foreigners. Many Israelites took the Assyrian and Babylonian quest, conquest as proof that the prophets accurately represented Yahweh's mind and will. The exiles who returned to Judea after the Babylonian conquest did not abandon hope for a state of their own and even organized several small Jewish states as tributaries to the larger empires that dominated the area. But the returnees also built a distinctive religious community based on their conviction that they had special relationship with Yahweh. The conviction enabled the Jews to maintain a strong sense of identity as people distinct from others, even as they participated fully in the development of a larger complex society in Southwest Asia. Over the longer term, Jewish monotheism, scriptures, and moral concerns also profoundly influenced the development of Christianity and Islam. The Phoenicians. The Phoenician trade networks north of the Israelites' kingdom in Palestine. The Phoenicians occupied a narrow coastal plain between the Mediterranean Sea and the Lebanon Mountains. They spoke a Semitic language referring to themselves as Canaanites and their land as Canaan. The term Phoenician came from comes from early Greek references. Sometime after 3000 BCE, the Phoenicians established a series of city-states ruled by local kings, the most important of which are the which were Tyre, Sidon, Beirut, and Byblos. Though not a numerous or a military Terribly powerful people, the Phoenicians influenced societies throughout the Mediterranean basin because of their trade and communication networks. Their meager lands did not permit development of a large agricultural society. So after about 2500 BCE, the Phoenicians turned increasingly to industry and trade. Although the Phoenicians traded overland, they were also excellent sailors, and they built the best ships of their time. Between 1200 and 800 BCE, they dominated Mediterranean trade. They established commercial colonies in Rhodes, Cyprus, Sicily, Sardinia, Spain, and North Africa. They sailed far and wide in search of raw materials, which took them well beyond the Mediterranean. Phoenician merchant ships visited the Canary Islands, coastal ports in Portugal and France, and even the distant British Isles and adventurous Phoenician mariners made exploratory voyages to the Azores Islands and down the west coast of Africa as far as the Gulf of Guinea. Alphabetic writing. <clears throat> like the Hebrews, the Phoenicians largely adapted Mesopotamian culture, cultural traditions to their own needs. Their gods, for example, were mostly adapted from Mesopotamian gods. The Phoenicians also creatively adapted the Mesopotamian practice of writing by experimenting with similar, simpler alternatives to cuneiform. By 1500 BCE, Phoenician scribes had devised an early alphabetic script consisting of 22 symbols representing consonants. The Phoenician alphabet had no symbols for vowels. Learning 22 letters and building words with them was much easier than memorizing the hundreds of symbols employed in cuneiform. Because alphabetic writing required much less investment in education than did cuneiform writing, more people were able to become literate than ever before. Alphabetic writing spread widely as the Phoenicians traveled and traded throughout the Mediterranean basin. About the 9th century BCE, for example, Greeks 
modified the Phoenician alphabet and added symbols representing vowels. Roman later, Romans later adapted the Greek alphabet to their own language and passed it along to their culture, cultural heirs in Europe. In later centuries, alphabetic writing spread to Central Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia, and ultimately throughout most of the world. The Indo-European Migrations After 3000 BCE, Mesopotamia was a prosperous, productive region where peoples from many different communities mixed and mingled, but Mesopotamia was the only one region in a much larger world of interaction and exchange. Mesopotamians and their neighbors all dealt frequently with peoples from regions far beyond South e Southwest Asia. Among the most influential of these peoples in the third and second millennia BCE were those who spoke various Indo-European languages. Their migrations throughout much of Eurasia profoundly influenced historical development in both South e Southwest Asia and the larger world. Indo-European origins. Indo-European languages during the 18th and 19th centuries, linguist, linguist noticed that many languages of Europe, Southwest Asia, and India featured remarkable similarities in vocabulary and grammatical structure. Ancient languages displaying these similarities, including Sanskrit, Sanskrit, the sacred language of ancient India, Old Persian, Greek, and Latin, because of the geographic location, regions where these tongues are found, scholars refer to them as Indo-European languages. Major subgroups of the Indo-European family of languages include Indo-Iranian Greek, Balto-Slavic, Germanic, Germanic, Italic, and Celtic. English belongs to the German, Germanic subgroup of the Indo-European family of languages. After noticing linguistic similarities, scholars sought a way to explain the close relationship between the Indo-European languages. The only persuasive explanation for the high degree of linguistic coincidence was that speakers of Indo-European languages were all descendants of ancestors who spoke a common tongue and migrated from their original homeland. As migrants established separate communities and lost touch with one another, their language evolved along different lines, adding new words, pronunciations, and spellings, but retaining the basic grammatical structure of their original speech. The Indo-European homeland. The original homeland of Indo-European speakers was probably the steppe region of modern-day Ukraine and southern Russia, where the earliest of them built a society between about 4,500 and 2,500 BCE. A central front feature Central feature of Indo-European society was the domestication of wild horses from the Eurasian steppe about 4000 BCE. Horses were initially used for food and soon thereafter for riding as well. When Sumerian knowledge of bronze metallurgy spread to the Indo-European homeland about 3000 BCE, Indo-European speakers devised ways to hitch horses, hitch to horses, wagons, and chariots. The possession of domesticated horses vastly magnified the power of Indo-European horses. Europeans, horses enabled magnified, horses enabled them to develop transportation technologies that were much faster and more efficient than other alternatives. Furthermore, because of their strength and speed, horses provided Indo-European speakers with a tremendous military advantage over peoples they encountered. It is perhaps significant that many groups of Indo-European speakers considered themselves superior to other peoples. The terms Aryan, Iran, and Ayer 
the official name of the modern Republic of Ireland, all derive from the Indo-European word are, meaning nobleman or lord, Iro. Indo-European expansion and its effects. The nature of Indo-European migration Horses also provided Indo-European speakers with a means of expanding far beyond their original homeland. As they flourished in southern Russia, Indo-European speakers experienced a population explosion, which prompted some of them to move into sparsely inhabited eastern steppe or even beyond the grasslands altogether. The earliest Indo-European migration began about 3000 BCE and continued until about 1000 BCE. Likely, like early movements of other people, these were not mass migrations so much as gradual and incremental processes that resulted in the spread of Indo-European languages and ethnic communities as small groups of people established settlements in new lands which then became foundations for further expansion the hittites the most influential indo-european <clears throat> excuse me migrants of in ancient times were the hittites about 1900 bce the hittites migrated to the central plains of anatolia where they imposed their language and rule on the region's inhabitants. During the 7th, 17th, and 16th century BCE, they built a powerful kingdom and established close relations with Mesopotamian people. They traded with Babylonians and Assyrians, adapted cuneiform, writing to their Indo-European language, and accepted many Mesopotamian de de deities into their own pantheon. In 1595 BCE, the Hittites toppled the mighty Babylonian Empire of, the Meso of Mesopotamia, and for several centuries thereafter, they were the dominant power in Southwest Asia. Between 1450 and 1200 BCE, their authority extended to eastern Anatolia, northern Mesopotamia, and Syria down to Phoenicia. After 1200 BCE, they unify, the unified Hittite state dissolved, but a Hittite identity survived, along with the Hittite language throughout the era of the Assyrian Empire and beyond. War Chariots War Chariots The Hittites were responsible for two technological invention, innovations, the construction of light, horse-drawn war chariots, and the refinement of iron metallurgy that greatly strengthened their own society and influenced other peoples throughout much of the ancient world. The Hittites' speedy chariots were crucial in their campaign to establish a state in Anatolia. Following the Hittites' example, Mesopotamians soon added chariots, chariot teams to their own armies and Assyrians made especially effective use of chariots in the in building their empire. Indeed, chariot warfare was so effective and its technique spread so widely that charioteers became the elite strike forces in armies throughout much of the ancient world, from Rome to China. Iron Metallurgy after about 1300 BCE, the Hittites also refined the technology of iron metallurgy, which enabled them to produce effective weapons cheaply and in large quantities. Hittite methods of iron production diffused rapidly and eventually spread throughout all of Eurasia, peoples of sub-Saharan Africa, and also probably China independently invented iron metallurgy. Hittites were not the original inventors, either of the horse-drawn chariots or of the iron metallurgy. In both cases, they built on Mesopotamian precedents, but in both cases, they clearly improved on existing technologies and introduced innovations that other people readily adopted. Indo-European migrations to the west, east, and south. 
While the Hittites were building a state in Anatolia, other Indo-European speakers migrated from the steppe to different regions. Some went east to, into Central Asia, venturing as far as the Cherim Basin, now Western China, by 2000 BCE. Meanwhile, other Indo-European migrants moved west. One wave of migration took Indo-European speakers into Greece after 2200 BCE, with their descendants moving into Central Italy by 1000 BCE. Another mig migratory wave established in an Indo-European presence farther to the west by 2300 BCE. Some Indo-European speakers had made their way from southern Russia into Central Europe, modern Germany, and Austria by 1200 BCE to Western Europe, modern France, and shortly thereafter to the British Isles, the Baltic region, and the Iberian Peninsula. Yet another Later wave of migration established in Indo-European presence in Iran and India about 1500 BCE, the Medes and the Persians migrated into the Iranian plateau, while the people sometimes called Indo-Aryans began filtering into northern India. As in earlier migrations, Indo-Europeans migrants borrowed from influence and mixed with the settled peoples they discovered and in so doing shaped future historical developments in each area. This is the end of chapter one, part two.